thank you all for standing by and welcome to our fourth and final webinar of the Crude Move webinar series entitled Regulatory Activity and Environmental Requirements. These webinars are an initiative of the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network and the Great Lakes Commission. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory. And joining me today are Dr. James Weinbreak of the Rochester Institute of Technology and Kathy Janice of the National Sea Grant Law Center. We're delighted to have them here today to talk with us about the legal issues of the crude oil transport in Great Lakes. Before I turn this over to Dale Bergeron, who will be introducing our speakers this webinar, I did want to talk through the logistics of the webinar. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the end of each presentation, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen. We have, uh, we have nearly 50 participants so far on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout the presentation. We should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey at, in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dale Bergeron of Minnesota Sea Grant. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanted to remind everyone that we're at the end of our four-part series, and this is simply a springboard for your own research and thought. Um, these things will, uh, these programs will remain in the archive and accessible um, even after the uh, finish of the series. Um, what we've attempted to do is first understand what's moving and where and why, both currently and historically within the basin in relationship to crude oil. We need to acknowledge the complexity of both the issues and the potential impacts of our choices as commodities move from one mode of transport to another across the basin. We need to understand the difference between a hazard and an actual risk and acknowledge why these issues can be confusing as we examine our transportation options. We also acknowledge the need for patience, collaboration, and systems thinking to illuminate, bridge, and enhance different uh, stakeholder expectations or goals uh, and to come to informed choices. And finally, we want to examine the complexity of spill response capacity across the modes who's involved, what we've learned, and how we can do better, um, which brings us to today. And we end on the examination of some of the legal complexities related to regulation and movement of crude oil, um, not only across the basin, but nationally, and new opportunities for geospatial tools to better understand and clearly illuminate the triple bottom line uh, embracing economic, social, and environmental good. Um, Without further ado, uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. James Weinbrake. Um, he is the, uh, in the College of Liberal Arts, excuse me, he's a professor of, the pub of public policy and dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Rochester Institute of Technology, and is an expert in energy, economic, and environmental analysis of multimodal freight transportation. He's previously created uh, an amazing GIS tool with the acronym GIFT, which you can find online, and he's going to continue talking about some elements and changes to that program that could lead us to a deeper understanding of what our issues are when we examine commodity movements and how to evaluate choices. Our final speaker will be uh, Catherine Janice. Um, she is a JD and a Master of Laws, and she's the research counsel with National Sea Grant Law Center at the University of Mississippi. Um, she has a background in natural resource law, water law, and agricultural law. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Weinbreak. Thanks, Dale. I appreciate that. And good afternoon, everybody out there. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to deliver uh, part of this webinar along with Kathy. I do want to thank Jill and the Ohio Sea Grant for, for their uh, coordination of this, and Dale and Minnesota Sea Grant. Uh, these, these types of events are really important. And they don't just happen on their own. They take a lot of work from a lot of people. So um, thanks both Bill and Dale. And I know you have uh, other folks in the, the National Sea Grant 
uh, program and your staff who've worked hard to pull this together. Uh, as Dale mentioned, you know, this, these are some fundamentally critical issues that are facing the Great Lakes Basin when we start talking about the movement of crude oil. And uh, there's no silver bullet. There's no one solution. In fact, there's a number of solutions and uh, that, that meet a number of different objectives. So for the first part of the webinar, uh, from now until about 125 or 130, I'm going to talk about some of these multi-objective, multidisciplinary systems types of issues and hopefully set the stage for then what Kathy's going to talk about regarding the uh, legal and regulatory environment that we're going to face under this uh, multi-objective framework. Um, I've broken up this, the, the first part of this webinar into four parts. Uh, first, I want to do some visualization activities with you all and show you some maps of um, why this is an important issue and why this is a multi-objective problem that we're facing regarding crude oil movement in the basin. Dale mentioned the work that we've done here at RIT on the GIFT model, the geospatial intermodal freight transport model. Uh, in conjunction with some colleagues around the country, and I'll, I'll introduce that to you all um, so you can see it, and there's also a website where you can play with that model. Uh, we have an example case that uh, I'll provide regarding GIFT to give you a sense of the usefulness of that model for thinking about crude oil transport in the lakes, and then just end on some next steps before passing the baton to Kathy to talk about some of the regulatory issues. So first, uh, let's think about visualization. And um, you know, the way that I framed this visualization is really talking about risk and impacts. And uh, I've been in some, some larger meetings with a lot of different stakeholders discussing this issue of crude oil movement. And you know, depending on what your position is on this, um, and some would argue it's an economic boon to the region. Others argue it's an environmental disaster for the region. There's issues with regards to fisheries and fresh water. There's issues with regards to port and rail infrastructure. So there's all these different perspectives. Um, and I, I think the challenge is how do we think about risk um, from all those different perspectives? So, uh, you know, defining risk as uh, a ratio describing the probability of an event happening with a, with a negative consequence. And um, let me see if I can get this going here. And in crude oil, you know, we tend to think of these risks in terms of episodic uh, spills or chronic leakages and what the impacts are on water quality, ecosystems, economies, and, and human health. But there's also a lot of other impacts that we need to be thinking about in this multi-objective framework that we're, we're structuring. And um, for example, air quality, you know, who, who would think about uh, the movement of crude oil in the basin as an air quality issue? Well. You know, frankly, if you live near a port area or a rail yard and you have um, equipment uh, using diesel fuel in those regions, um, there are air quality issues depending on the type of mode that you choose to move, move the, move the uh, uh, commodity. Also noise and safety, employment issues, infrastructure issues, even cultural resources, particularly with the tribal lands, um, something to think about as well in terms of this larger problem context. Now, I'm going to show some maps to help visualize this, and these are layered maps. Um, the next handful of slides will present some of these layered maps. It's only a visualization at this point, so we haven't done any significant qualitative or quantitative analysis yet. I'm going to leave this slide up for a second because this uh, set of maps is interactive and it's available online. And at the risk of you all going to your browser and not listening to what I have to say, um, I'm still going to put this address up here, but the HTTP address is there. It's an ArcGIS model, so that's arcg.is slash 2aq39nq. Um, the last Q is capital. If you go there, you'll see some of the uh, maps that I'm going to show, and you'll also be able to uh, select different layers to display. And I want to thank Jordan Silberman, uh, who's affiliated with the University of Delaware and RIT for a lot of this work. He's, he's an incredible GIS superstar, and uh, he's done some really good things with, with this work. So let's just start simply with the watershed. So this slide has a, and if you go to that website, by the way, you'll, you'll see something akin to this. And um, 
the layers, uh, if you can, you can access the layers by clicking on the, the second icon to the left under the word examining, uh, which you can kind of see is highlighted in this slide. But here's, here's the Great Lakes watershed. And um, I'm just going to add some features. Again, the, the perspective, the, the point of this is really to think about risk in terms of transporting crude and, and the many different uh, stakeholders and um, ecosystems that might be affected. So here's a uh, layer of the ports in, in the Great Lakes region. You can see those. <clears throat> I'm now going to add where the refineries are. So here's U.S. and Canadian oil refineries. Um, kind of see where they are. This is where the crude oil would be delivered to, presumably, unless it was being shipped overseas. <clears throat> we'll add the pipeline infrastructure. This includes both proposed pipelines and existing pipelines. Um, net, network of pipelines, uh, does not, the entire network can't service the crude oil that we want to move, but it gives you a general sense of what the pipeline network looks like. There tends to be concentrations in some of the urban areas. A lot of the pipelines coming from the North, North Dakota region um, are moving crude, as was discussed, I think, in previous webinars. There's railroads and facilities. So facilities would be uh, rail yards and transfer facilities. I know this might be difficult to see on the slide, but I'll go back one. Um, it's the black lines that show up or some of the major rail lines. So I'll kind of go back and forth so you can see those show up. And if we zoom in on this, and if you were online on the website zooming in, you would see um, a, a larger number of rail features. But you can see where some of the rail facilities are. We want to add major highways. Zooming in would give you a lot of the other um, auxiliary roads. But we could add major highways. Of course, we're building the transportation network as we, as we proceed through here. And we can add uh, the network of, of shipping. And this is based on vessel density. So these are actual shipping patterns based on reported movements of ships in the Great Lakes area. Um, you can see some of the Atlantic Coast area as well, but I'm kind of want you to focus on that Great Lakes area. So, you know, this kind of gives us our physical infrastructure of uh, rail and pipeline and highway and waterway modes of transportation. It gives us a sense of where the ports are, where the refineries are, where the rail yards are, and it captures all that within the uh, outer blue line of the Great Lakes watershed. Now, what I want to do is overlay this with some of the uh, major risk concerns that have been talked about in previous webinars and in other meetings that uh, many of you have been at. <clears throat> I'm going to zoom in a little bit in this next slide. And what I've highlighted in the orange are what EPA has identified as Great Lakes areas of concern. So these are, these are areas that the Environmental Protection Agency has identified as areas of ecological concern, and um, you can see where some overlap, uh, existing networks, existing ports, uh, even some refineries. I'm going to add coastal wetlands. So this should come out as a bright green on your map. I'll go back and forth once so you can kind of see these emerge. There it is without wetlands. I'm going to add the wetlands, and you can see the wetlands along the coast of the Great Lakes. Uh, many folks who are um, thinking seriously about crude oil movement in the basin, especially on the waterways, are thinking about the impact on wetlands. You'll see some of the proposed pipelines in the red are going directly through wetlands, so that's something we need to think about. I'll add the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, critical habitat areas. Again, I'll go back and forth once so you can kind of see that, that uh, yellowish-orange emerge there. <clears throat> and we don't want to forget people. Um, so this is a population density map. Uh, the darker red colors are where the, uh, the larger, uh, more dense population of people. And um, of course, I already mentioned air quality, and that's an issue of, uh, that people are concerned about from a health standpoint, um, but also from uh, drinking water access and other things, uh, we, we want to include people. And of course, there's, there's a host of other types of, of objectives and, and uh, issues that we could visualize in this kind of map. But the, the real point is to, to identify and capture 
um, these types of effects, where the impacts might be, and then to start thinking about how can we move crude oil in the basin in a way that minimizes risks to these ecosystems, to populations, et cetera. So that leads us to uh, this, this research question. Can you, can you construct a multimodal network for crude oil transport that minimizes the risk or at, at the very least allows decision makers to assess some of those risk trade-offs, some of those cost-benefit analyses? And that's, that's something we've been working on for a number of years, and it's uh, emerged through a software package called the GIFT model, the Geospatial Intermodal Freight, Freight Transport Model. Uh, we've done this at RIT in partnership with the University of Delaware, and we've had funding from a number of generous agencies. In particular, the US DOT, MARAD, has been um, very generous in supporting this work. Uh, Great Lakes Maritime Research Initiative, California Air Research Board, uh, Resources Board and others have, have supported this work. Um, so we thank them for their support. And I, I want to spend a few minutes just talking about GIFT and making a connection to this, this issue of crude oil transport. So the GIFT model, <clears throat> this is a, a model, it's in the, a GIS environment. We've programmed it in ArcGIS and it, it really allows us to do several things. First, we um, and I'll get into the model details, but, but essentially we built this model so we could look at the economic, energy, environmental, and time of delivery trade-offs with regards to freight transport. And, and I'll show you an example so you can see how those trade-offs are made. Um, we wanted to look at multiple modes, so highway, uh, rail, and waterway. And we, we also want to use the model to explore some different freight transport policies that were being discussed and are still being discussed at the U.S. Department of Transportation and, and possibly by some of uh, your states. I noticed there's a number of state agencies uh, represented on this, on this webinar. So what, what we did was, you know, essentially um, what existed in the public data sets that were available, safe through NTAD, um, three independent networks, a rail network, a road network, and a waterway network. And one in the past was able to do network analysis uh, and look at transport across each of these networks, but they were three distinct separate networks. And what we wanted to do was build a model that allowed someone to evaluate the transport of goods where uh, that transportation could shift modes in, in route from origin to destination. So in the GIS environment, we took these three networks and we constructed what we call a hub and spoke uh, uh, method where we connected, for example, the, the road network represented up here with, with a line on the top left, the rail network represented by the railroad tracks in the top right, and the water network represented at the bottom with the horizontal blue line, where these were connected in, in the network environment through some kind of transportation hub. Now, it, it, th those transportation hubs are represented by, for example, ports or uh, rail yards where we actually see these networks connect. So, for example, a port is probably the best example where you see your water network connected with a rail network and also connected with a highway network. Um, so we, we uh, use the database that, uh, the available databases of port locations and rail yard locations to create these hubs that then were used as um, uh, connector points with, with spokes to each of the different uh, each of the different networks that we had for road, rail, and water. And essentially, it let us build uh, for the United States and Canada and other parts of the world, too, uh, an intermodal freight network. So now we can look at uh, freight flows from origin to destination, and we can look at those uh, freight flows as they move from one mode to another. Now, mode selection is an interesting question. That's sort of the decision that one has to make. If I'm going to move goods from an origin to a destination, do I put it on truck, do I put it on ship, do I put it on a train, or do I put it on some combination? And, and the, the decision that you make depends on your uh, objectives. So the other key feature for this network is we also added uh, network attributes related to uh, not only time of delivery, how quickly can I move something from origin destination, or distance, 
what's the shortest path from origin to destination. But we also uh, populated the network with environmental attributes. For example, what's the carbon footprint associated with every uh, arc and node on this network? So if I wanted to move something from origin to, de to destination, and my objective was to reduce carbon emissions, for example, I'd be able to use this network to do that analysis. Um, this network has maximum flexibility, so users can also populate the network with economic inputs, um, criteria pollutant inputs, I mentioned greenhouse gas inputs, as well as time and shortest distance. So if you want to think of this, it's kind of like a Google Maps where you put an origin and a destination in. Um, however, it does not require you to only be on a highway. It will move you to rail or water if necessary. And the other thing it does that, say, a Google Maps doesn't do is it allows you to uh, minimize your path based on different objectives like environmental objectives or cost objectives. Okay. We have in the model different, uh, I, I know the font on this is small, I, the intention isn't for you to read everything on here, but the point is we have a calculator where, you, where the user can put in information about the type of truck they're, they're, they're using or the type of train or the type of ship, and uh, a calculator will um, help populate the network based on the type of equipment that you're using, and that will then give you the opportunity to run a number of different cases. So let me show you an example case um, to maybe make this a little bit more real. Um, this is an example we did um, for, for Marat a little bit ago, looking at container movement from Cleveland to Toronto. Uh, we had a specific vessel in mind. It was called the Dutch Runner, and so there's some information about its speed and power. And, and this is all important because these are the types of attributes of the vessel that affect emissions. And as you'll see, we did our analysis on some, some um, minimizing emissions objectives. So, uh, you know, the, the way the model works is you could put in information about your, your truck and your ship and your train. It'll populate the network based on that. And then you can start to run these least cost uh, scenarios or, or shortest path scenarios, I should say. So in, in this map, this is showing the least time route from Cleveland to Toronto. And this is primarily, as you might imagine, a highway route. Um, and so from a least time perspective, uh, this, this is a single mode, put it on a truck and get your, get your goods from, from Cleveland to Toronto. But we can also look at this from a least cost standpoint. And again, this is based on the data that we put in for the model. I don't know if you could see that blue line that just emerged where shipping, um, putting it on a vessel uh, was selected by the model as being the least cost. There's a little bit of uh, multiple modes in there from the Cleveland area. Um, getting it to the port, of course, requires some trucking, um, but once you get it to the port and on a ship, uh, your least cost, economic cost, is to move it by ship. And then we also did a least carbon dioxide uh, scenario, and that'll show up as green. And um, it looks uh, similar to the, to, the, um, to the highway, but it's actually on, mostly on rail. There's a little bit of truck involved, but it's mostly a rail movement. And, you know, the numbers are going to change based on the type of ship and the type of train that, that you assume and that you put your data in. But, but ultimately, this, this table on the bottom right gives you a sense of how to do trade-off analysis. And so you can, for example, in this case, look at, at cost trade-offs versus carbon trade-offs. So uh, I could, I could uh, or time trade-offs, I could put my goods on a truck, get there in six hours, but I'm going to have a carbon dioxide impact of 340 kilograms. Um, or I could put it on rail, it's going to take a bit longer, but I'm going to cut my CO2 emissions by two-thirds. So, um, uh, you know, this is the usefulness of this. Now, we've already done, we, we've also included things like particulate matter, which is criteria pollutant. So here's a, a route that's a least PM route. And um, again, based on our assumptions, this mostly came up as a rail solution. Um, but you could also, one of the things that we looked at is, well, what if uh, particulate matter emissions were reduced on a ship by 95% um, due to new standards? And at, you know, at what point would the uh, vessel route be the least particulate matter route? 
Um, particulate matter, by the way, for those who aren't aware, is a carcinogen and um, uh, causes lung cancer and cardiovascular disease in humans. So um, looking at a least PM route with a 95% reduction, we really go on ship. But again, the point is that we, we have the flexibility that depending on what your objectives are, um, you can populate this model and, and operate it and look at what some of the trade-offs are. Um, we, we, we don't have pipeline currently integrated into GIFT. It's one of the things that um, we've been working on and it's probably in our next steps, but we have a couple sample slides of what that might look like. So here's, uh, again, the multimodal network that I kind of showed earlier, but this has the pipeline network overlaid on it. We have not yet connected the pipeline network to the rail network or the waterway network. That would be the next step in our research. Once we get pipelines in there, though, we can do these kinds of um, shortest path analyses, looking at moving crude from, uh, say, North Dakota to a refinery on the East Coast. Um, but just so you can kind of visualize what that looks like, here's a, here's a map with the pipeline layer on top of it. And we've, we've done some, you know, example runs of what this might look like of uh, the green is the pipeline. You can see, you can envision different, different routes here, right, where you start on pipeline and you, you go to uh, Duluth and the port and you put it on a ship and vessel and you bring it, in this case, over to Buffalo. Um, you could bring it on highway, um, you could bring it on rail. So you can see the different, op uh, the different options that you have, and with the modeling, we can evaluate what the pros and cons are. Now, the other thing you could try to visualize is think about the earlier slides I had, where you have, for example, EPA's um, uh, sensitive regions, or you have the fish and wildlife uh, regions, or you have coastal wetlands and you start to overlay those with these different transportation options, and all of a sudden you can start to build a network in which you try to minimize risk and, importantly, see what the costs are associated with minimized risk. These, are, these risk questions are always trade-offs, right? You, you can always minimize risk, but usually there's a cost involved, and you really got to understand um, what those trade-offs are and um, evaluate those in a kind of a cost-benefit type of approach. So. Um, you know, that's essentially it. I wanted to whet your appetite. I, I, I wanted to, uh, in terms of next steps, we are integrating this, uh, uh, planning on integrating the pipeline system in to the, the GIFT model. Um, I noticed there was a um, uh, question regarding access. The, the model is online. A web version doesn't have as much capacity uh, as I showed, but there is a lot of capacity. And if you go to WebGIFT, dot rit dot edu. I apologize, I don't have that on this slide. If you want to send me an email, I can send you the link. But it's webgift, all one word, w e b g i f t dot rit dot edu. Pretty self-explanatory in terms of uh, uh, running your own cases. Again, it does not yet include pipeline, um, but it does let you down select different types of ships. We have a library of ships, a library of trains, a library of trucks or you can choose to put in your own type of equipment and um, you can select what you want to optimize on. It's not, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, uh, it's not as fast as Google Maps. Um, we don't have the billion dollar server that they have, so <laughs> you have to have a little bit of patience when you hit run. And, um, um, but it, 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 you know, if you run into any issues, feel free to, to send me an email. And my email is here, jjwgpt at rit.edu. So, uh, Jill and Dale, I think that's it for the slides for me. And um, if people have questions, uh, I'm in a situation where I'm, I may not be available right uh, at, during, after Kathy's talk. So please feel free, though, to shoot me an email, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible with, with answers to some of those questions. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, James. We will. Um, we do have a couple questions, so we will relay those over to you, and we uh, and we'll post those on the website. Those answers um, on the website. So thank you again for being on uh, the webinar. Um, I, for just time purposes, I would like to uh, go on with uh, Kathy Janice. Uh Kathy, I am going to. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to grab the presenter ball and get your presentation up. 
and then hand over the ball to you, Kathy. Great. Hey, can you hear me? You sound great. Thank you. All so, right. everyone, thanks again for having me on today's webinar. Again, I'm Kathy Janzi, and I'm a research counsel with the National Sea Grant Law Center. And so, for those of you who are not familiar with the Law Center, I've highlighted where we are among the map of Sea Grant programs throughout the nation. And so, our mission is to encourage a well-informed constituency by providing legal information and analysis to the Sea Grant community, policymakers, and the general public through a variety of products and services. So we're located at the University of Mississippi School of Law, and we you know, aim to reach this mission through a couple of different ways, such as conducting research on current ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes law issues, providing outreach and advisory services, and then periodically holding workshops and conferences and webinars like today to kind of give this research out to you all. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be mostly focused on the Oil Pollution Act, which is a United States law. And so I put this slide back up from Jamie's presentation that he just gave to kind of highlight the amount of issues that are involved with the laws and regulations of moving crude oil through this region. There's a lot of issues in play, and so it would be hard to cover everything. And I've provided this little screenshot from a great report from the Great Lakes Commission that was, they put out last year that kind of highlights some of these issues in moving crude oil through this region, just to show that the amount of regulations and laws out there are completely overwhelming at some point. And so these are, that screenshot is just current issues with rail movement. And so I'm going to focus on the Oil Pollution Act and kind of highlight some current issues that we're facing through the movement of crude oil in response to that act. So, to start off with, you know, why are we concerned with the movement of crude oil through the Great Lakes region? So first, you know, a potential spill in the Great Lakes could be catastrophic. So in particular, we don't really know how many spill response tools and techniques would work in fresh water. And in addition, as this screenshot shows, we've seen an increase in actions, you know, concerning oil, both in the U.S. and in Canada. So to highlight that in 20. 2010, an oil pipeline ruptured near Marshall, Michigan, spilling nearly 1 million gallons of crude oil into nearby Talmadge Creek, which caused one of the largest in -loss inland area spills in U.S. history. And similarly, in 2013, a train transporting crude oil derailed and exploded in Quebec, which killed 47 people and caused billions of dollars of damages. And so these incidents have really put on everyone's radar kind of the risks involved with moving crude oil, how it's regulated, and it even has caused both U.S. and Canadian officials to kind of really take a hard look at their regulatory regimes. So I want to start with a brief overview of the Oil Pollution Act, and then I'll move into kind of how the act applies to vessels, pipelines, and rail. And so the act itself was what we call reactionary legislation to the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So if you'll remember back to 1989, the Exxon Valdez spilled over 11 million gallons of Alaskan crude oil into the water of Prince William Sound. And this spill really highlighted that the U.S. did not have adequate resources and funds to respond to oil spills, and that the federal law did not provide for adequate damages for those impacted by a spill. So in particular, the scope of damages commensable under the federal law to those impacted by a spill was fairly narrow. So in 1990, Congress passed the Oil Pollution Act, or OPA as it's known, which amended the existing Clean Water Act and addressed how to prevent, respond to, and pay for oil pollution incidents in the navigable waters of the United States. And what's important to note there is that the law focuses on navigable waters. And so it's oil spilled into navigable waters, and this creates some issues with regulation that I'll discuss a little later on in the webinar. So OPA created a comprehensive prevention, response, liability, and compensation regime to deal with vessel and facility-caused oil pollution to U.S. navigable waters. OPA increased federal oversight of maritime oil transportation and provided enhanced environmental safeguards through setting new requirements for vessel construction and crew licensing and manning, mandating contingency planning, enhancing federal response capability, 
broadening enforcement authority, increasing penalties, creating new research and development programs, increasing potential liabilities, and significantly broadening financial responsibility requirements. So today I'm going to focus first on oil spill prevention under the Act, and in particular how it applies to vessel pipelines and rails, and then later I'm going to talk about liability under the Act when an oil spill actually occurs. So under OPA, certain facilities are required to prepare what's known as a facility response plan, which must be submitted to EPA. This requirement applies to owners and operators of offshore and onshore facilities that could reasonably be expected to cause substantial harm to the environment by discharging oil into or on navigable waters. The plan needs to describe how the facility will respond to oil spills. The plan should identify the response personnel and equipment flow path of potential spills and vulnerable natural resources, evacuation and notification plans, and response training programs, including drills and exercises. So when we're thinking about vessels, the flashback again to Jamie's presentation, you know, there's a lot of potential to move crude oil on the Great Lakes. Um, and this map is again showing us kind of the current, you know, shipping lanes that are being used. So, in 2011, more than 19 million metric tons of refined petroleum products were transported on the Great Lakes and through the St. Lawrence River Seaway. And was, although there is refined petroleum transported on the lakes at this time, no crude oil is transported on the Great Lakes at the current time, but crude oil has been transported on the St. Lawrence River. So, in the United States, ships transporting oil are governed by OPA. The U.S. Coast Guard has regulatory authority for offshore areas, including the Great Lakes, while the U.S. EPA has the authority for inland areas. I want to note that Canada has enacted similar laws governing oil transportation by vessels, including the Canadian Chipping Act. And so under that act, the Canadian Coast Guard created the National Spill Response Plan to address maritime emergencies for the Great Lakes, connecting channels, and the St. Lawrence River. So vessel response plans are required for vessels operating in U.S. waters that transport oil. The U.S. Coast Guard reviews these plans, and the plans must meet requirements for the area's geography, and as required by OPA, the resources, methods, and techniques used if there is an oil spill. I, I want to note, though, that the Coast Guard has stated that currently there are not adequate response methods and techniques for spills of heavy oils in open bodies of fresh water, such as the Great Lakes. So right now, these you know, vessel plan requirements could prevent moving heavy crude oil by tanker vessels on the Great Lakes. And so this is an issue that everyone's watching to see if and when we actually start moving crude oil on the lakes. So in regards to pipelines, the United States contains about 183,000 miles of hazardous liquid pipelines. The Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration is responsible for implementing OPA as it applies to onshore oil pipelines. The program has several elements to ensure that pipeline operators can protect the environment from major oil spills. The agency's regulations cover design, construction, operation, maintenance, and emergency response efforts of these pipelines. The agency's pipeline safety program aims to protect people and the environment through risk management, regulatory compliance, and federal state partnerships. So certain pipeline operators, again, are required to develop facility response plans. And so the operators of onshore oil pipelines that could significantly harm the environment by discharging oil into or on navigable waters must re submit a response plan to the agency. So one pipeline that I want to highlight and is what these pictures on my slide are showing is the Line 5 pipeline. So each day about 540,000 barrels of light crude oil and natural gas liquids roar through Line 5, which is located at the junction of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. Line 5 consists of two 62-year-old pipelines that extend across the Straits of Mackinac's 4.5-mile width at a depth of greater than 150 feet. And so Enbridge, which is a Canadian-based company, owns Line 5. And while there's never been an issue with Line 5, the Enbridge Line 6B spill, which I referenced earlier in 2010, has generated a lot of public concern regarding Line 5 
due to its age and ecologically sensitive location. And so this concern for Line 5 in particular, you know, led to new pipeline legislation that was passed just this summer. So on June 22nd in 2016, Congress passed the Protecting Our Infrastructure of Pipelines and Enhancing Safety Act of 2016, also known as the Pipes Act. The Act defines the Great Lakes as a high consequence area for an oil spill, which triggers mandatory integrity assessments. Further, for pipelines located in the Great Lakes at depths greater than 150 feet, the Act further requires an annual integrity assessment. Additionally, the Act requires pipeline operators to incorporate ice-covered waterway containment and cleanup measures into their emergency response plans and response to concern about how an oil spill would happen on the Great Lakes. So the Act lists, as I said, the Great Lakes as an unusually sensitive area. And because the Great Lakes are designated as this, operators in the region are required to conduct facility risk assessments and to adopt and implement a written integrity management program to reduce risk. These assessments must be conducted at a minimum once every seven years and include the following assessment methods, criteria for evaluating assessment results, data integration to assess facility integrity and release consequences, description of action to be taken if an integrity issue is raised, and measures to prevent and mitigate release consequences. And as I said further, the Act places more stringent assessment requirements on Line 5 due to its depth. So the Act includes an additional section that requires any underwater hazardous liquid pipeline facility located in a high consequence area with any portion of the facility at depths greater than 150 feet to conduct an annual integrity assessment. So now for um, line five, they would have to do these assessments every year. And so finally, pipeline facility operators are now required to maintain information relating to the facility's operations. So this would include emergency response plans, and the operators must determine the worst case of discharge and produce a response plan that includes procedures and resources in order to respond to a worst case discharge or a substantial threat of such a discharge. So finally for rail, according to the Congressional Research Service, um, Due to uncertainty around expanding pipeline capacities in North America, um, oil producers are increasingly using rail to transport crude oil supplies. In fact, in the last seven years, we've seen something like a 50-fold increase in the transportation of crude oil by rail. So with this increased movement, there's been also an increase in derailments. So here again, I have a picture of the derailment that happened in 2013 in Quebec. And since that derailment, there's been 20, 22 subsequent train accidents in the United States concerning trains carrying crude oil. If we add this to the fact that about 25 million Americans live within the immediate evacuation area of railroads carrying crude oil in the U.S., we've created kind of this concern about the safety of rail movement. So the Department of Transportation oversees all transportation by rail, usually through sub-agencies like the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, as well as the Federal Railroad Administration. DOT and its agencies are charged with promoting safety in every area of railroad operations and reducing railroad-related accidents and incidents. And since the derailment um, in Quebec, DOT has noticed that, noticed that the amount of recent crude oil, oil railroad accidents is startling, and they have spilled a voluminous amount of crude oil. So in particular, I just want to highlight two concerns that are really being raised at this point about crude by rail oversight. So one issue is that rail bridge management in the U.S. is greatly lacking. In addition to aging infrastructure, funds are just not there to allow for robust inspections at this time. So the Federal Railroad Administration has acknowledged that present funding levels only permit the agency to observe about 2% of the nation's railroad bridges. And an April 2015 press release from New York Senator Chuck Schumer also kind of highlighted this issue. So in that release, the Senator's office noted that only 1% of the 70 to 100,000 privately owned train bridges across the entire country are audited in any given year. In New York State, 
alone, there is only one specialist that's assigned to over 3,000 privately owned train bridges, and that specialist is also responsible for bridges in 13 other states. And that is because there are currently only seven federal inspectors for all of the privately owned train bridges across the country. So when we're thinking about this increased movement, this lack of oversight is a real concern for many who are considering this issue. Another issue actually has to do with interpretations of the provisions of OPA. So as I mentioned earlier, under OPA, onshore facilities that are reasonably expected to cause substantial harm to the environment by discharging oil into or on navigable waters have to develop spill response plans. However, a 1996 regulation stated that only the largest rail cars that carry over 1,000 barrels of oil would meet this test. So rail cars under this capacity only need to submit what are known as basic plans. And so I just want to note that very few rail cars actually meet this capacity to carry over 1,000 barrels. So there are not comprehensive response plans for most cars carrying crude oil right now in the United States. These rail cars are only required, again, to you know, submit what are known as these basic plans. And rail cars are this point, the only kind of transport of oil who kind of has created this subcategory of plans. I would note that there has been political pressure to update this rule, and new regulations have been proposed but not passed yet. So this is something that's definitely on U.S. officials' radar at this point in time. So now I kind of want to switch gears from kind of the issues we're facing with spill prevention over to kind of what would happen if there was an oil spill into navigable waters in the United States. So the Clean Water Act is the primary structure for regulating discharges of pollutants into U.S. waters. So Section 311 of that act includes the prohibition on discharges of oil. The Clean Water Act also includes civil and criminal penalties for these discharges. And following the Exxon Valdez spill, as I stated, OPA was passed specifically aimed at responding to and addressing kind of these environmental and economic damages from oil spills. So to trigger liability under OPA, you have to have a discharge of oil into navigable waters, and it must be harmful to the public health or welfare of the environment. Both the Clean Water Act and OPA define navigable waters broadly to include water subject to the ebb and flow of the tide, though, you know, some think that maybe the definition of navigable waters under OPA is not quite as large as it would be under the Clean Water Act. So, under the Act, responsible parties, which is the party that's responsible for the spill, have strict liability for damages and cleanup costs. Responsible parties can include the lessee or permit holder of the area, as well as owners and operators of vessels and pipelines. Though the responsible party is strictly liable under the Act, the Act does offer a limited number of defenses to this strict liability. So these are carefully defined and can include acts of God, acts of war, and acts of third parties. OPA limits the responsible party's liability at a total of all removal costs plus $75 million per incident. But in certain situations, the caps can be lifted. So these include when incidents was caused by gross negligence, willful misconduct, or violation of a federal safety construction or operating regulation. So for those of you who have been following litigation concerning the Deepwater Horizon spill, you might recall that the judge in that case did find that BP acted grossly negligent, which is why the cap for that spill was much higher than these numbers. The cap can also be lifted if the responsible party fails to report incidents or cooperate in removal activities. But as in most situations like this, the government bears the burden of proof that the liability limits do not apply. So again, with the Border Hurry Up Prize, and as an example, the government affirmatively proved that BP was grossly negligent and they needed to make that showing at the trial. So under OPA, both the government and private parties can recover damages. So three of these damages can only be recovered by the government. And these include damages for injury or loss of natural resources, damages for increased cost of public services incurred by the state during the removal activities, and damages equal to the net loss of taxes, royalty, rents, and fees owned to the government. OPA 
So, and its provisions also, also provide for private parties to recover certain damages. So these include economic losses from destruction of real or personal property, the loss of profits or impairment of earning capacity due to the loss of property or natural resources. So thinking of Deepwater Horizon, that would be, for example, Gulf fishermen who couldn't fish after the Deepwater Horizon spill. And it also allows for damages due to the loss of subsistence use of natural resources. So if you think back to Exxon Valdez, that would include tribes who couldn't, you know, subsistent hunt after the Exxon Valdez spill. So finally, responsible parties under the Act, again, can be subject to criminal and civil penalties. Um, in light of time, I don't want to go through these in too much detail, but you can see that, you know, the fines can be up to $25,000 per day or $1,000 dollars per barrel of discharge. Um, and again, if you're grossly negligent, you need to pay at least a minimum fine. And just to know again that other criminal provisions of acts could apply if there's a discharge. And I've listed some of those acts there where you can be facing, you know, subsequent penalties and charges under those acts. And then finally, just factors that courts will take into consideration when they're determining the penalty. I'll run through these quickly again. It's the, kind of the seriousness of the violation, the economic benefit that the violator got from this bill, any degree of culpability, other penalties that they're kind of facing from the incident other, under other acts, history of prior violations, the nature, extent, degree of success of any effort of the violator to minimize or mitigate the effects of the discharge, the economic impact on the violator, and other matters this justice may require. So again, the courts would be thinking about a couple different things and kind of determining what a penalty would be under the Clean Water Act. So I want to highlight, again, kind of what has happened with that bill that I referenced later, that I referenced earlier in Talmadge Creek. So this past July, the Department of Justice and the Environmental Protection Agency announced a settlement with Edinburgh to resolve claims stemming from the 2010 oil spills in Marshall, Michigan, and Romeoville, Illinois. So under this settlement, Enbridge agreed to spend at least $110 million on a series of measures to prevent spills and improve operations across nearly 2,000 miles of its pipeline system in the Great Lakes region. And Enbridge was also going to pay civil penalties totaling $62 million for Clean Water Act violations. So $61 million of that you know, penalty is from that spill in Marshall, Michigan and then another million for discharging at the Romeoville, Illinois location. The settlement also included an extensive set of specific requirements to prevent spills and enhance leak detection capabilities throughout Enbridge's Lakehead pipeline system. So Enbridge must also take major actions to improve its spill preparedness and emergency response programs. And under the settlement, Enbridge is also required to replace close to 300 miles of one of its pipelines. So the thing I really want to highlight this Enbridge, you know, settlement to go back to what I started at the beginning with the passage of OPA is what we see a lot in terms with oil spill prevention, we see a lot of reactive regulation. So after Enbridge spills, they now have to face these increased requirements to kind of make sure their pipelines don't do it again and not necessarily those increased requirements beforehand to see you know, that this bill doesn't happen. So my last couple minutes, I just want to run through how we kind of pay for oil spills in the United States. So when OPA was signed into law, it authorized the use of the oil spill liability trust fund. Um, but at the time, the fund was actually already four years old, but it took OPA to kind of authorize its use and able to collect money and able to pay for oil spills. So the use of the fund you know, is to kind of pay for these oil spills. And the fund is, you know, funded through a collection of tax on the petroleum industry, and it's actually increased up to $1 billion. The Act delineated kind of what the fund could be used for, so these include removal costs incurred by the Coast Guard and EPA, state access for removal activities, Payment to federal, state, and Indian tribe trustees to conduct natural resource damage assessments and restorations. Payment of claims for uncompensated removal costs and damages. Research and development, 
and other specific appropriations. And again, just to highlight the fund, it's funded through this kind of what is now this eight cents per barrel tax on oil producers to kind of make sure that the United States is now able to kind of pay for these oil spill cleanups. So I just want to highlight one other issue that we're facing with the fund and crude oil, and I'm sorry, this just shows the um, income from the fund, and you see this huge spike, and that spike is, of course, from Deepwater Horizon spill violation um, that's been collected into the fund. So the fund, at this point in time, has quite a bit of money in it. But we're seeing this issue with crude oil in particular in that the definition of oil has different meaning under the tax code in OPA. And so in 2011, the IRS released this memorandum saying that tar sands imported into the United States are not subject to the excise tax imposed in the code that would fund the oil spill liability trust fund. In comparison to that, OPA has defined oil very broadly to mean that oil means oil of any kind or in any form. And so what does this mean is that this oil that maybe is coming in from kind of Canada, this heavy crude oil, isn't actually being taxed to pay it into the fund. But if that oil was to spill, that spill would actually be able to tap into the fund to pay for the cleanup. And so some people are thinking this is creating some kind of equity issue and that we're kind of wanting to go back and kind of fix this issue to make sure that if it's going to be covered by the fund, if there's a spill, that it should actually be paying into the fund and not kind of being exempt at this point in time. So to wrap up, I just want to highlight some pretty good resources that are out there. So as I said at the beginning, the Great Lakes Commission has a very thorough report on this that's able to you know, delve into these details of these issues much more in depth than I was able to do in this short webinar. And if you're interested kind of in that tax issue that I just highlighted at the end, the Congressional Research Service has issued kind of a bulletin that kind of delves into that issue in more detail than I was able to do right now. So with that, I will wrap up. Um, here's my contact information. I'm happy to take questions either now or in the future if you'd like to email me. And so thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, we got a, a couple of questions, uh, and we have a few minutes, so this is perfect. Okay. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about why the focus on navigable waters with these laws, since pipelines run through areas with smaller streams as well, are those not covered? Can you talk a little bit about why navigable waters? Sure. And so that goes back to, again, where OPA is coming from. So the Oil Pollution Act it was an amendment to the Clean Water Act. And so the Clean Water Act has always been focused on what is known as these navigable waters. And the reason that is, is under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, um, the federal government can only regulate kind of these larger bodies of water that can kind of be used in interstate commerce. So it's kind of an issue that's you know, really based in the Constitution and issue of federal power. So the idea is that the federal government wouldn't have the ability to go in and regulate some kind of smaller stream or waterway that might not necessarily be able to be used for interstate commerce. So that's kind of where it's coming from. It's mostly a limit under the Constitution. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Uh, one other question, and this is, um, uh, dealing with Seaway monthly traffic reports. Um, we had a question from someone asking, and I'm going to just read this because there's some detail to it. Uh, the July 2016 Seaway monthly traffic results report shows a 27.5% increase in liquid bulk traffic while all other cargo traffic is down by between 9% and 28%. Is this reflective of a new shipping trend? I do not know that answer off the top of my head. Um, that's not something I've looked at or would have an answer to at this point in time. I'm happy if someone, you know, the person we asked wants to reach out to me personally to kind of follow up with them. But right now I can't answer that off the okay. top of my head. 
All right, and your contact information is on that last slide, so this is great. Okay. Um, well, what I want to do is uh, just remind everyone, I'm going to hand the closing over to uh, Dale here in a second, uh, but I did want to thank Kathy, thank uh, Dr. Weinbreak for uh, presenting today. I also want to remind everyone that I put a URL for a survey in the chat feature, so please feel free to uh, take a few minutes and fill that out. We also have resources on the go.osu.edu uh, crude move webpage. This uh, webinar series is, again, sponsored by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network and the Great Lakes Commission. And Dale, I wanted to give you a few, uh, few minutes, a, a minute to wrap up uh, this webinar series since this is our, our final uh, webinar of this series. Thank you very much. I, I, I just want to remind everyone that we had to start with the basic assumption that if oil is going to move, how do we move it most wisely within the basin? We've already seen uh, the closure of a pipeline um, in Wisconsin create an emergency order both in Wisconsin and Michigan due to its impacts of immediate um, transference onto road and, and marine modes. Um, so we know that this is a problem. What we need to do, and I think it was very uplifting to see Dr. Weinbreak's material, is we need to wrap in human dimensions and we need to dramatically broaden um, uh, some of the um, data-driven material in the um, modeling of logistical advantages that are being used. And we can do this. That's the good news. The bad news is it's complicated. And um, not only is it complicated, but we have to include uh, both um, market norms and social norms. And social norms involve emotion and they involve potential pleasure and displeasure. And so we have to communicate. That's the role of Sea Grant. We look for a basis for uh, building bridges, for finding science-based alternatives and information, and acknowledging human dimensions. And it's been a pleasure working with the Great Lakes Commission on this effort. Uh, they do outstanding work, and we're delighted to uh, um, anticipate further work in the future. And thank you all for participating. Thanks again, everyone. We'll email everyone when the webinar is up in the archive. Thanks again, Kathy and Dale, uh, for your participation in this webinar.